the cross. It was meant to horrify the world. It was meant for humiliation. It was meant to last for days. It was meant for slow asphyxiation. It was meant to prolong torture. It was the Roman soldier's job. It was meant to be used by Caesar, but instead, it was used by God. It was meant to stop a movement, but instead, it became the way. It was meant to act on fear, but instead, it awakened faith. It was meant to be vicious and violent, but instead, it became our peace. It was meant to uproot hope, but instead, it became the seed. It was meant to punish captives, but instead, it unleashed freedom. It was meant to build up Rome, but instead, it built God's kingdom. It was meant to discourage rebels. It was meant to stop insurrection. It was meant to put down Jesus, but instead it set up his resurrection. It was meant to jeer and mock him, but instead it was his glory. It was meant to erase a chapter, but instead it became the story. It was meant to hold up convicts, but instead it raised up a king. It was meant to shut our mouth, but instead it's why we sing. It was meant to be a judgment, but instead it became our mercy. It's why the song of heaven is the lamb. The lamb is worthy. It was meant to kill an enemy, crush dissenters and diversion, but instead it became the banner of God's love for every person. It was meant to be appalling, nailing hands and feet to wood. It was meant to be used for evil, but instead it was used for good. It was meant to be a symbol of God's assassination, but instead it became the symbol of Jesus' invitation. Come to the cross. Instead of sin and stain, you are meant to be made clean. Instead of being forgotten, you are meant to know your sin. Instead of being ashamed, you can leave behind your guilt. Instead of feeling empty, you were meant to be fulfilled. Instead of being broken, you are meant to be made whole. Here, Calvary is calling. It beckons you. Behold, come to the cross. Instead of being an accident, you have a purpose and a plan. Instead of being abandoned, you were chosen by his hand. For all who've said, I can't, God has said, I can. No matter what you've done, the invitation stands. Come to the cross. Instead of being doubtful, you are meant to know your father. You are meant to be his son, and you are meant to be his daughter. You were cherished from the start. You were always in the picture. Instead of being a victim, you were meant to be a victor. The result of Jesus' blood, salvation has arrived. Instead of being dead, you are meant to be alive. The cross, it was meant to signal death, but instead, it's a sign of living. It was meant to be the end, but instead, it's our beginning.
to my Pulse family and to all of our online viewers. I'm so excited to be able to open up our service today in prayer. And I wanted to add real fast, just a little message of encouragement. Um, even though in today's world, when everything seems to be canceled and we're doing things a lot differently than we usually would, we're not gathered as a family of believers in a church building somewhere, but that doesn't mean that the message of today is any different. We still serve a living, risen Savior, and that's the reason that we are happy, we are thrilled, we are excited for today. So I encourage you that as you listen to our service to pray, to uh, get involved in worship, stand, lift your hands, get excited, shout and dance if you want to because you are serving a living Savior. And uh, make sure that you're listening to Pastor Jay's message. Uh, so I just wanted to add that because that's something that even I needed to hear. That even though it's a little bit different and I'm not getting my children dressed in their Easter dresses, um, that we're still going to be happy today because today is so, so worthy of celebrating. So if you would please bow your heads with me as I open up our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for Easter Sunday and what it means. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you did not stay dead in a tomb on Friday. Because of what you did on Friday, I can have a relationship with the Heavenly Father and that you were the perfect sacrifice for that, Lord. But it didn't just end there. We thank you, Lord, for your resurrection. What we celebrate today allows us to be able to know that there is hope, that we have a relationship with you. You could listen to us when we talk. You know us in and out, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the promises that you are always going to keep you're never going to let us down, Lord. So as we come to you today, we pray that every single person would listen and they would remember what this day is actually about, Lord. Let them be happy. Let them be excited because you are so worthy of the praise and the honor and the glory because you are a living, risen Savior. And in your name we pray. Amen. As the worship team begins to start singing again, I want you to stand and sing and um, just be in your living room, lift your hands and worship, and uh, we'll get back to our worship team. Thank you guys.
Hey Kids Club, glad you all are back. We are, as you can see, in a different location. Just like take a look around, see where you're at. All right, and then we're right down at the bottom of the hill up at the house. And as you can look behind me, we got this big cliff face. All right, like big. A little bit of hikes I've taken you all on, we've been above that, now we're at the bottom of it. And you all know how I love stories. Well, Courtney and I have hiked all of this many times, all right? And normally we get to about a point where we gotta climb back up, all right? And throughout the hike, we might find trink like little trinkets or maybe like little pieces of animal bones or feathers and stuff. Like we found this little shell on one of our hikes, just an empty little turtle shell. All right, pretty cool. And, but it gets hard when we have to go back up because we want to bring these things back. I remember there was one time that Courtney and I had found like, I don't know, six or seven like deer skulls or other animal skulls or bones and things like that. And Courtney wanted to collect them, all right? That was all her. Well, we had our hands filled with these bones, right? And, like a symbol of like bones and stuff is normally death, right? And in the Bible, in Romans, it says that the wages of sin is death. Now, I know it's Easter, so this is a message about hope. But as we're told, the wages of sin is death. And sometimes we all find ourselves at the bottom of a valley like this at the bottom of a cliff face. And we're hanging on to the trinkets and the bones and the things that we found down here. We're hanging on to the sin. When, do you wanna take a look back up here? Jesus is at the top of these cliffs. He's up there and all he is doing is extending his hand down for us to grab and lift us out. That was the purpose for him coming to earth and sacrificing himself for us. But can I take Jesus' hand if I have my hands full of trinkets and bones and sin? No, I have to let that all go so that I can take his hand as he's trying to pull us up and out of it. Because let me tell you, when Courtney and I were trying to hike up this thing with all those bones in our hands, it was hard. And a lot of those bones would fall and tumble back down the hill or we ourselves would probably go backwards because we did, couldn't use our hands to grab on and pull ourselves out. And in the Bible, a verse that most of you probably already know that Mike is going to read to us, it's a symbol of hope and why Jesus is hope. Take it away. So John 3:16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Exactly, right? When we are with Jesus and we are saved, we don't fear death. We don't fear sin because we have eternal life. And that is the hope that Easter brings to us. And it's that when we sometimes find ourselves in this metaphorical valley that we're hanging on to our sins, but Jesus is there reaching down his hand for us to grab. But we can't grab it because our hands are full. 
That moment when we choose to live for God is when we choose to let go of our little trinkets and choose to grab hold of Jesus' hand as he is pulling us up out of there. All right? That is our word for you. Easter is a time of hope. It's a time of happiness. And that is what this message is meant to bring. It's not meant to bring worry or anything because Jesus is alive. And he is here reaching for us to pull us up out of whatever sin we might find ourselves in. All we have to do is let go of all that. And he'll lift us up right now. All right? So we miss you all. We love you all. We can't wait to see you all again. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the service. I'm going to go climb this thing.
morning, guys. I'm going to read today's scripture for us. The scripture today comes from John 20, 11 through 18, and Luke 24, 11 through 12. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. But they did not believe the woman, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day, for what this day means. Lord, we're thankful that Friday the story wasn't over, and we're thankful that you rose from the dead on Sunday. And Lord, we hold hope with that. We hold on to hope with that. And we just thank you for this day. We praise you. We glorify your name. And we love you. And Lord, although this is different, Lord, I pray that you would anoint Jay's message that's going to be coming through live stream and be recorded on the internet. But Lord, you can work and you can work in a mighty way. So Lord, I pray that right now that people in their homes that are watching this, that, that people uh, are watching this maybe months later, uh, this is being recorded and they're re-watching it. Lord, I pray that in this moment that you would bring special anointing. In this time that you would bring special anointing. God, you work all things out for good. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would come into each and every heart, into each and every soul. I pray that today that people would be saved, God, that Jay would have an anointing on him like never before, and that you would be glorified. We are happy and we have hope because on Easter, Lord, you rose from the dead. We love you and we praise you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. Now, you may wonder why I'm standing in a dark room with a screen behind me with thunderstorm and rain coming down. But I think it's for us to grab hold of the feeling of Easter. If we remember on Friday, what we call Good Friday, Jesus was crucified. And because Jesus was crucified, his disciples had scattered and ran away. If you remember Peter, one of the strongest, most valorous of the disciples, had even cursed him and saying that he didn't know anything about the man and ultimately showed he didn't want anything to do with him. And so they all ran and they hid and they disappeared. Their hearts were hardened and they had become very sad because everything that they had hoped for for Easter had disappeared. Everything that they had hoped for in Jesus was gone. Everything that they had wanted Jesus to be, He wasn't. Or at least so they thought. They wanted an earthly master. They wanted someone to set up a, a godly kingdom. They wanted someone who would take their oppressors and defeat them. And yet, as far as they knew, as far as what they saw, as far as what was in front of them, they saw the very opposite. 
They saw the Messiah, the one that they thought would deliver them. They saw Him crucified, killed, laid in a tomb. So they found themselves in a very dark place and they found themselves in a very difficult place and they found themselves in a place where, where they didn't know where to turn. They had given up everything and they had turned away from life as they knew it for Jesus. And now Jesus was gone. Or so they thought. Now Jesus had, had been taken away. Now Jesus had been defeated and they were left alone and oppressed and trying to figure out how to get their life back together. I think sometimes in our culture and sometimes in our place and sometimes in our day, we live in the same dark, stormy environment that the disciples lived in after Jesus had died. We bring ourselves to this place where we want salvation and we want heaven and we want Jesus and we want all the things that Jesus said He could do in our lives. But yet we find ourselves in this place of, of uncertainty. We find ourselves in this place where, where we are not really sure how to live out all the promises that Jesus has for our life. The funny thing is, I had planned to do today's message in the rain. I looked at the weather forecast and I, I, I wanted to literally stand in the rain and give you today's message, or at least the first part of today's message, in a cold downpour of rain according to what I saw in the weather. Now maybe, maybe God's sitting up in heaven and he's going to tell you you're, you're kind of nuts. And no, especially with everything going on, I'm not going to let you preach the message in the rain, so I'm going to change the forecast. It's going to be... Uh, somewhat sunny and, and everything, and no, you're not going to preach the message in the rain because I don't need to get in a cold with everything else that's going on. All right, so, okay, God, well, well played. But what I want, the picture I really want to paint to you is that sometimes we live in this place of hopelessness and we live in this place of despair because of how we think and because of how we live and because of how we choose to pursue what Jesus is doing and where Jesus sits in our life today. The scripture Medora read for you. She read to you about Mary and, and how Mary came to the tomb. And, and Mary wanted to anoint the body of Jesus and Mary wanted to, to take this moment to, uh, to do the very best that she could do for this one who had changed her life and to set her on a new path. And I can only imagine Mary's heart broken, uncertain, confused as she came to the tomb that day. And so many times we live our Christian life like Mary. So many times we show up to church sad, angry, bitter, because we're not getting what we want. Because we're not receiving what we think we deserve. Or we're not at least getting what we hoped for. And what we thought Jesus could do for us. And so what we find is we find that, that the situation the disciples were in and the situation that the followers of Jesus was in are, are not that different than the situation we're in every day. We come to church, we go through the motions, we read our Bible, we have Bible studies, and we get a whole lot of exposure to Jesus Christ. But in having that exposure to Jesus, we never really truly embrace Him. We never truly embrace all that He is. We never really truly embrace all that He offers. And we never really truly walk the path He set before us. And you preach this kind of message and you begin to think to yourself, well, here's another preacher just beating me over the head, just telling me everything that I'm not. But when in reality what we're trying to do is we're trying to help you see everything that you are and everything that you can be in Jesus. Because a lot of us, a lot of us 
know what we want. A lot of us know where we want to be. A lot of us know what our goals are. A lot of us know what we want Jesus to do for us. But we never take the time to really rise up and let Jesus do what He wants to do in our lives. And to me, that's what Easter is all about. As long as we show up to church and as long as we go through the motions and as long as we continue living a life that only rains down doom and only rains down despair and only rains down wannabe over us, we will never truly ever be what God intended us to be. So we're no different than Mary and we're no different than Peter and James and John and, and all of the other disciples that, that sit around scared, wondering what's going to happen next, wondering if this will happen for us or if that will happen for us or how come all of these things we hoped Jesus would do in our life and for our lives could take place. You know the words of Mary when she, when she ran into what she thought was the garden keeper say a whole lot about where she was in that moment. And I think sometimes they say a whole lot about where we are in life. When Jesus appears to Mary and Mary thinks he's the garden keeper, she says to him, where have you put him? Where have you put Jesus? And sometimes I think we ask that same question of ourselves. Sometimes I think our doom and gloom Christianity, our Christianity that looks to serve flesh and looks to serve self, and when we don't get gratified here, well, we'll just go down the street to the next place because it's bright and shiny and ooh, ah, cool. And only in a matter of time we find ourselves in the same doom and gloom. So we go on down the street to the next place, to the next doom and gloom, and to the next doom and gloom, and to the next doom and gloom, because we're looking for something that satisfies, satisfies our flesh. And we're not looking for something that moves us into the direction of Christ. And we're not looking for something that changes us from the inside out through the blood of Christ according to His work on the cross. See, we live in a culture that says, do you. We live in a culture that says, be the best you. But that is, that is absolutely the opposite of what Scripture tells us to do. Last week I preached a, a message, if that's what you want to call it on video, I preached a message to you that I talked to you about the invitations of Christ. And I talked about Jesus, how, how in our situation of trouble and turmoil, he, he invites us to come to Him and rest because He holds all the answers and He holds all the power. But I think sometimes what we lose sight of is we lose sight of an earlier invitation that Jesus gave when He said to us to come to Him, deny ourselves, and take up our cross. And follow him. You see, if we're just bouncing from one shiny neon sign to the next, we are missing the point of Jesus Christ. If we're if we're moving from one satisfy me to the next, we're missing the point of who Jesus is, and we're missing what he came to do. If we're if we're bouncing from, from what makes me feel good today, but doesn't tomorrow to the next feel good, and the next feel good, we might as well be bar hopping, friends. Now, I hope none of you out there, especially the kids, ever go down that course in your life, but I was there once. I was there once. And you want to know what it was? It was standing in front of the mirror, putting my clothes on, fixing my hair just right, putting on the cologne, making sure that I looked just right so that when I would go to, to those places, I would attract what I thought I wanted. I would become who I thought they wanted. And I would play that game to the point and the place to where I lost myself 
and I gave in to temptations, and I gave in to things that led me away from the core of who I was, from the core of what I was. And it spiraled me into darkness, and it spiraled me into relationships, and it spiraled me into situations that I never thought would be part of my life. But you see, I wanted the next shiny thing. I wanted the next, I wanted the next pretty person in my life. I wanted the next cool scenario that would come my way. And so I became everything that I thought I needed to be to obtain it. And sadly, that's what a lot of us do in church today. Sadly, a lot of us come and we play a part hoping we can, can trick the church, but more importantly, hoping we can trick God into giving us what we want and what we think we deserve. Friend, listen, if, if that's the theology that you, you've been given, and if that's the theology you walk in, and if you have people gratifying you in that mindset, then the reality is you are being led a, down a destructive path. And a path that doesn't take you anywhere where Jesus is, because Jesus' path is very bright and it is very clear. And it says to us, deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow me. That's the invitation of Christ. He doesn't promise us a rose garden. He doesn't promise us the prettiest and flashiest of things. And He doesn't promise us a whole lot of feel goods. Matter of fact, as, as I quote many times, He promises tribulation. But in promising that tribulation, He promises us victory. And by promising us victory, He takes us to a place where He says, I have overcome. He doesn't say you've overcome. He doesn't say you will overcome. He doesn't say that, that you will do all of these things that I came to do. He says that I have overcome. It is He who will bring the peace. It is He who will bring the rest. It is He who will bring the victory. The Bible tells us that all things work together for good to them who love Jesus. So quit exposing yourself to a whole lot of stuff and find Jesus and fall in love with Him. Pursue Him and seek Him. Him, and I promise your doom and gloom, your frustration, your bitterness, your anger, it will all go away. Why? Because you absorb yourself into the thing that is real and the thing that is right and the thing that will change your life. You see, between Friday and, and Sunday, the disciples were trying to figure all of that out. Between Friday and Sunday, the disciples didn't understand, and they didn't know. Even in the upper room, when, when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, Jesus went on to tell him about his denial. And he told Peter something very important. He says, When you are converted. What does that mean, converted? What does conversion really say to us? It means that we have to be given over to a new way of thinking. We have to be given over to a new way of living. And that is where Easter comes in. And yes, that is where Easter comes in. And that is why Easter matters. The whole world brightens up for us. When we find Jesus where he is, we no longer look around trying to figure out where we've laid him or what someone else has done with him. But you see, when Mary was distraught thinking that he had been taken and thinking that he was gone and, and thinking that all of her hope that she had placed in him had been squashed and crumbled, Mary was in darkness. She was hurting. She was maybe angry and bitter. She was definitely pursuing and, and trying to figure out what was next. 
Unfortunately, that's sometimes how we live our Christian life because we've never really grasped Easter. We've never really grasped the idea that Jesus is alive. And we've, we've never really grasped the idea that we don't have to walk around in the rain anymore. And we don't have to live our lives in, in, in the storms and in the struggles of this life. Why? Because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus lives, we can face today, let alone tomorrow. Because Jesus lives, we can live. Because Jesus lives, our hopes and our passions die to the world, but come alive in him. And we are called to a place of living that is far above what the cross could provide. It's far above what the tomb could provide. It's why on Easter, the cross is empty. The tomb, well, it's been opened. And because it's been opened, we, like those who ran to the tomb, can look in and see that Jesus isn't found in defeat. Jesus isn't found in destruction. And Jesus isn't found where the world can put him. Instead, like Mary found on her way, she can find Jesus right where he is. And because you and I can find Jesus where we are, we can find hope, we can find victory, and we can begin to live in the power of the cross. You see, this matters because until we choose to walk in the power of the resurrection, until we choose to deny ourselves, which brings death and enmity, when we walk in ourselves, when we walk in the flesh, when we live to please our flesh and make ourselves happy, then ultimately we find destruction on that way. But when we choose to come to a place where there's hope, and when we choose to come to a place where Jesus is our light and our king, well, then we can rise up. We can go to the tomb. We can find it empty, and we can, we can look at the cross, and we can remember the work of the cross and the significance that it has for our life. Because of the blood Jesus shed. And it means the redemption of our sin. But we are not meant to live on that cross. We are not meant to live in that tomb. But yet we are meant to live where Jesus is. And when we start to do that, we will rise. We will rise and we will rise with authority and we will rise with power. And there is no one who can take away from us what God has given. You see, to find life, we have to choose to lose life. And we don't like that, right? It's a struggle. I get it, right? I, I, I go through the same thing. I'm not saying this like I figured it all out. But what I have figured out is when I choose to live where Jesus is, when I choose to walk where Jesus is, when I choose to do the things that Jesus does, no matter how the world sees me, no matter how the world uh, uh, portrays me, no matter what people talk about or what people say, when I choose to quit bouncing around from the flashy things and the things of this life that edify my flesh, and I choose to walk in the presence and the glory and the holiness of God through Jesus Christ then he lights up my world with a power and a victory that I'll get nowhere else nowhere else you see Mary Mary found Jesus that day and he wasn't in the tomb and he wasn't on the cross 
He wasn't dead and he wasn't, he wasn't gone and her hopes weren't crushed and her, 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 her wonders of life weren't taken away. But she found the victory in Jesus because Jesus lived and he could now deliver all of the promises that he had given. And so she runs to the disciples and she tells them what she had seen or what she hadn't seen in the tomb. But yet she told them what she found on the road. What she found in the garden that day. And that was Jesus. And scripture tells us something very interesting about Peter in that moment. You see, Peter had denied Christ after promising he never would. Scripture tells us that he even cursed doing so. Peter went to the depths of the flesh to deny the one that he had vowed his life for. Because he had hoped, he had hoped to find victory in a king. He had hoped to find victory in, in someone who, who would oppress those who had oppressed him and many others for a number of years. He had hoped to be able to walk away from men who thought of themselves to be something when they were nothing. But if Jesus was dead, none of that could happen. So he cursed him. He rebuked him. He pushed off everything that Jesus was and everything that Jesus had been. Every day they spent together. Every moment that they had. Every healed person. Every sanctified individual every memory peter had he rebuked and turned away because of the darkness and yet when mary came and gave him hope for a moment that jesus was alive scripture tells us that peter arose Scripture tells us that Peter arose. Peter stood up. Peter left everyone else behind and he ran to the tomb. Now John followed. But Peter ran and Peter looked in and Peter saw that Jesus was gone. And he pondered all of the things. He wondered about all of the things that Jesus had promised. And that Jesus would bring into his life. And his world began to light up. And his life began to light up. And on the side of the sea one day, Jesus appeared. And he came and he met with Peter. And he began to talk to Peter and began to ask Peter about why he had turned back. And why he had denied him and why he had allowed all of the darkness and all of the doom and gloom and all of the lack of victory to come back to him. And Peter asked, or Jesus asked Peter a simple question. Do you love me? Do you love me? You see, for God so loved the world that Jesus died on a cross. He was laid in a tomb. And it was the power of that love that raised him up for me and you. And until we fall in love with Jesus, not the idea of Christianity, not, not the idea of, of being somebody famous in the church, or, or not the idea of, of, of this worldly religion with all of its bells and whistles, when we lose the idea of, of earthly things associated with Jesus, when we fall in love with him. 
We fall in love with every word that he gave us in scripture. We fall in love with, with how he, he caressed and loved those that he came in contact with. We, we, we fall in love with his mannerisms and we fall in love with his dedication to the Father and we fall in love with Jesus to the point that we're willing to deny ourselves and take up a cross follow him you see when Jesus approached his disciples for the very first time he, he gave them an invitation he said follow me follow me and they did they followed him on the dusty streets and they followed him in, into the scary towns and, and then they followed him into the temple and they followed him when, when he confronted the, the religious leaders and, and they followed him when he healed the woman with the issue of blood and they, they followed him when he raised the dead. They followed him. But when it came time to take up their cross and follow him, you see, they weighed the cost because they saw the cost of the cross. They saw the length Jesus was willing to go to to save humanity. And they questioned if they could do it. And you see, we, we do that too. We count the cost. We, we look, we look at, at everything that we have to give up and, and we wonder if it's enough and if it's worth it. Sometimes we sit in rooms surrounded by those just like us and we contemplate and we discuss and, and, and we wonder if, if maybe the next place will be better. And the reality is as long as you're pursuant of the flesh and as long as you're pursuing your feel good from here and your feel good from there and, and your feel good over there and everywhere else that it might take you, you will never fall in love with Jesus. You will never embrace his invitation to follow him. Friend, if you want the sunny hillside and the sunny meadows, and if you want, if you want the, the relationship with Jesus that feeds you and floods over you and empowers you in life, Then, then you're invited. His invitation to, to, to Peter and, uh, and, and James and, and John is, is the same invitation to you. Follow me. Come to where I, I am. You see, we can, we can wander our way to the tomb like Mary and wonder where he is, wonder where we've put him. Where have you laid him? Where have you, where have you put Jesus? Friend, where have you put Jesus? Where have you chosen for Jesus to stand in your life? Where is he? Is he on the top of your mind? Is he, is he overflowing your heart? Is he moving you with compassion? To those in need around you? Is he, is he drawing you to a place of holiness and a place to make better decisions and, and a place to live as he lived? Are you, are, you, are you busy defending your choices because you're not making the choices that he made? You see, Easter brings us to a place where we have to see the cross. And if we don't see the cross, we will never see a resurrected Savior at the right hand of God working for me and you. If we don't see the tomb he was laid in, if we don't realize 
that we are called to deny our flesh and take up our cross to live out our life in love with him and in love with the things that he was in love with in spite of what it cost us we will never see our Easter we will never see our resurrection we will never rise to what God has called us to So maybe this isn't your typical Easter message. Maybe I'm not standing out in the rain like I planned to because God's a whole lot smarter than me. And maybe I'm not really on a, on a pretty hillside with a lot of flowers and things like that, like I kind of envisioned all of this. But, but maybe the reality is that you're not either. Maybe the reality is you're in a place somewhere between knowing Jesus, knowing who he is, knowing what he's done. You can tell the story, but you're not living it. You're not living it because you never denied yourself and you never really picked up a cross. Maybe, maybe a moment here, maybe a moment there. Maybe for this occasion or for that occasion, maybe for popularity's sake, or maybe that cute girl or that cute guy in youth or, or whatever your situation may be, maybe... Maybe you've had moments, but it's never become a lifestyle. You see, all of the disciples, the guys who changed the world, the guys that Jesus built a church on their testimony, because they believed, because they chose to walk away, because they embraced Jesus. And who he was took him a little bit of time. Same as, same as it did for me. Same as, same as it probably did for you or, or, or is for you right now. Took him a little time. But when they were converted, when they denied themselves, when they picked up their cross, they walked in victory. And the demons of hell stepped out of their way because the authority of heaven was on their shoulders. So friend, if you want all that you've hoped for, if you really truly want the shiny things of heaven, not of earth, but of heaven, if you really want the power and manifestation of Jesus Christ in your life, the invitation is deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow him. Follow the resurrected Savior. Follow the one that works all things together for your good. Follow the one who when everyone else says it's impossible, he parts a sea. I don't know about you, but I weighed that cost for a very long time. I made some really bad decisions and I went to some really stupid places and I did some really dumb things trying to satisfy me, trying to, trying to find the shiny things that made me happy, trying to find the pleasure in this life only to be let down again and again and again. And I wanted to blame God. I wanted to say, God, this is your fault. I wanted to say, God, I'm here because of you. God, I, I, wanted, I wanted him to be the reason. I wanted him to still be on the cross, and I wanted him to still be in the tomb. And I wanted to be able to point a finger and say, you let me down, Jesus. Only to find that when I quit looking for the world and I ran into him on the road, he called me by name. He lifted me up and he invited me to a life where he would always be with me. So I denied myself. I took up my cross and I followed him. 
And because I've seen the proof and because I've seen the evidence of who he is every day in my life, I choose to rise every morning, deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him again. And tomorrow, because I've seen the proof and because I've seen his power and I've seen his authority work in me and others, Tomorrow, I'll rise. I'll deny myself. And I'll take up my cross. And I'll follow him. What about you, friend? Where have you put Jesus? Where is he? Is he on the shelf? Collecting dust? He, is he at your job? Is he in your bank account? Is he in your, your car or all the cool things you got in your garage? Is he in your kids? Is he in, is he in this place or that place? Is he in this relationship? Is he in choices that you're making to feed your flesh instead of embrace his love? I mean, we could go on and on and we could dig up a whole lot of stuff. But I think you know, I think you know where you've put him. I think you know what you've done with Jesus. And isn't it time to arise? Isn't it time to rise up and walk in the resurrection and life of Jesus Christ? You're invited. You're invited, and so am I. I choose Jesus, and I trust you do too. God bless.
I love to hear that song, Oh, the blood. The blood means so much because that is what saves us. Just that one drop that he shed for us will save each and every one. This morning, we're under un uncertain circumstances. First Easter service I haven't been in in years because of this uh, disease. We just pray this morning for each and every one of you. As we get ready to close in prayer, we just want you to understand that we are here. We are still here for you, the pulse, the leadership, the teams, each one of us. If you need us, just give us a holler. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning, dear Lord, for the songs and the testimony, for the preaching, dear Heavenly Father, for Jay, for the ones that are watching, for the ones, dear Lord, that will watch later. We just pray, dear Heavenly Father, for this time that is of uncertainty, but we know we will get through this. We just know, dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, without a shadow of a doubt, that it will come to an end. We just pray, dear Heavenly Father, for those that are out here throughout the different states, for those that might be afflicted, dear Heavenly Father, for those that might be in the hospitals. We just pray, dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, for them. We pray, dear Lord, for the watch care over each one that's in their homes, dear Heavenly Father, where tensions are running high, stress is running high, but dear Lord, just let us turn back to you. Let's turn to Heavenly Father. We just ask this morning, dear Lord, that you watch care over each and every one of us. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for those that uh, need that extra touch upon this Easter Sunday. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for everything you've done for us, everything that you're going to do, and whatever holds tomorrow, dear Lord, that we know that you're still in control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.